Our scripture comes from the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. The word of life. That was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus the Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Praise God for his word. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity that we have every Sunday morning to look into your word and to learn from it. I just pray, Lord God, that your spirit would be here and that you would speak to each of us where we are and that we would hear your voice and that we would respond to what you're calling us to do. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time. It's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the last, oh man, I don't know how many weeks, maybe five months, we've been going through the Apostles' Creed, uh, line by line. And next week, we're done. Next week is the last one. Um, this week we're focusing on what's the second to last line in the Apostles' Creed, which is, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And even though it's the second to last line, it's kind of like the core, it's kind of like the crux of the whole thing. It's kind of it's what Christianity is focused on, the forgiveness of sins. So if we're going to talk about that, I guess we should define some terms, right? And so the question we want to ask, first of all, is what is sin? Saxon, I remember the first time I, when, the first times I ever met you and Kelsey at Dr. Hawkins in the God Club, and we were talking about sin. I don't know if you remember this or not. And, you, and I just talked about it, assuming everybody knew what it meant, and then either you or Kelsey put your hand up, and I said, yes, and you said, what's sin? And I, had to, <laughs> I said, and I learned at that point, I'd better explain things, <laughs> you know, because you can't assume that everyone knows. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I always remember that story. It, it, it's always reminded me from here on in, never to assume and always try to explain. One thing about the word sin is people don't like it much anymore, right? Because people say, well, talk about sin. They kind of go, well, you're judging me. You can't say uh, that what I'm doing is a sin. And so people have a hard time accepting it, but it is a very important word in Scripture and a very important part of what we need to understand in order to know God. Scripture defines sin as missing the mark. So think of, anybody ever do archery in high school? I did, I hated it. But ever, you take the bow and arrow and it's got the target over there and shoots the arrow towards the target and, and then if you're like me, you'd miss. <laughs> and you would totally miss the mark, miss the bullseye. Missing the mark means falling short of God's standard. God has a plan and a standard for each of our lives. And if we miss the mark, then we miss God's plan and standard for us. Now, don't feel bad, like I'm singling you out saying, well, you've missed God's standard for your life, because we all have. Every single one of us. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sometimes when I'm trying to explain sin to teenagers, I use, I, I use the, um, the context of hurt, because I think they can understand that better, where um, sin is where you've hurt other people, you've hurt yourself, or you've hurt God. Hurting other people is kind of straightforward, right? We know it's wrong to, to cause pain to other people. Hurting ourselves, sometimes we don't always see that in the same light because sometimes we don't always value ourselves. But hurting ourselves is something that God doesn't want us to do. And then hurting God. Uh, sometimes we, we don't see God as someone who can be hurt, but when we 
fall short of his standard for our lives when we disobey him and do our own thing, when he's kind of going, I've got plans for you, I want them to be good for your life, and we kind of run the other way, it breaks his heart and it hurts him. Sin also separates us from God. It breaks the relationship from, between us and God because, as we were singing before, God is holy and God is pure, and sin can't live in his presence, which if you just leave it at that, we're kind of like toast. But he really wants us in his presence, so he's made a way to deal with that. Sin creates static. Even if we have a relationship with God and we allow sin to get into our lives, it creates static. So it's hard to, to, to see, hear him or hard to want to be in his presence. You know, if you were a kid and you did something really wrong and you kind of knew your parents knew about it, the last people you wanted to see was your parents, right? He's like, you, you would hide in your room. You would try to hide away because it's like, I don't want to face this because I know. And it's the same with God, you know. When we, when we know we're kind of doing things the opposite of what God wants us to do, the last place we want to be sometimes is church or praying or talking to God. And so we avoid. Um, so that kind of defines what sin is. So the first step in, I believe, in forgiveness of sins is to, to admit that we're sinners. And that's hard because it, 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 it hits at our pride. Like we don't want to admit that we've done wrong things or that we're not the greatest person in the world. Or, and it also kind of cuts against a lot of the self-esteem talk that we hear today. And, um, you know, we're, we're told we're valuable, which we are. God values us so much that sometimes some of the things we do aren't always good. And so we have to kind of be, uh, to separate the two. Um, it's not something that people like to admit. Um, 1 John 1.8, we're actually going through 1 John at our Bible study on Tuesday night at 7.17 at Chris and Erica's, so please be there. But 1 John 1.8 1, says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim that, oh, I'm okay, I mean, I haven't done anything really that bad, um, the scripture says we're just kind of fooling ourselves. The first, it's so important to be able to admit we've sinned because if we don't, then what do we need forgiveness for, right? If we haven't done anything sinful or wrong, I don't need forgiveness. But the Apostles Creed in the scripture is saying just how desperately we need to be forgiven, and God has provided that. And the first step to be forgiven is to admit, I got something I need to be forgiven of. So how do we know what sin is? Okay, so is it subjective? Is it just kind of depend on, on us and our own moral values? Um, what's wrong for me might not be wrong for you. And I think a lot of places in society kind of think along those lines. But if you think that to, through to its logical conclusion, it can create a lot of conflict. If I think it's not immoral for me to steal, right? I can go over to Aaron over there and just walk over there and take his skateboard and walk away. And I'm like, that's all right. That wasn't, a, that wasn't an immoral thing to do because for me, it's not, I, don't, I don't have a problem with stealing and I want a skateboard, so tough. And Aaron's kind of going, but how am I going to get home? <laughs> how am I going to be able to get around? Um, you can see that if, if morality is subjective, then you take that to its logical conclusion, it just creates conflict and people are just going to do whatever they want. Each person does what is right in their own eyes, the book of Judges says and it, it creates chaos. Well, is sin situational? Like, in this situation, yes, that would be a wrong thing to do, but in this situation, I can see how I might be able to justify myself. Some people think along those lines too, but then again, who's to decide that this situation is the good situation to do that thing in, and this situation is the bad one? How do we know? Some people think that, well, it's just impossible. It's just impossible to know what sin is. And the best you can do is just live your life and do the best you can and hope that when you get to the pearly gates, St. Peter will say, well, okay, come on in. And I've, I've met people who think that way, and it actually makes me sad because you don't have to live your life not knowing one way or the other if you've been accepted by God and, and heaven is your home. You can know for sure. And then there's some people who just think sin's irrelevant. The whole, this whole conversation is just irrelevant. There's no such thing as right or wrong, no such thing as good and evil. They just don't exist. But the truth is, as we've seen in the scripture, that they do. How do we know what sin is? We know what sin is by objective moral law. 
by an objective moral law, something outside of ourselves that tells us what right and wrong is. And the only being who has that capability, that, that um, position to be able to tell us what is right and wrong and to present us with an objective moral law is God. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Why does God give us an objective moral law? So that we can know where that line is. So that we can know what right and wrong is. So that we can know that when we've crossed it, we, we need to ask for forgiveness. I think about speed limits when I think about this, this topic. On the 401, speed limit's 100. No one goes that. But it is 100 and it's posted. What if they didn't post it? What if they didn't post the signs and everybody just went as fast as they wanted to? And you'd be whipping down the 401 at 200 miles an hour, kilometers an hour, sorry, showed my age, 200 kilometers an hour, and a police officer pulls you over and says, you were speeding. And you'd be like, well, there's no signs. How do I know? How do I know there's... I thought this was like the Autobahn. I could just go as fast as I want to. The signs are there to tell us when we've crossed the line. And in the same way, God has given us an objective moral law so that we know when we've sinned. We know when we've crossed the line. We know when we've broken God's heart by falling short of his standards. So he's given us an objective moral law, but he's also given us something called a conscience. Now, a conscience is more than that little voice inside your head. It's more than Jiminy Cricket and Pinocchio. There's, a conscience is actually God's Holy Spirit. It's God's Holy Spirit talking to you. Whether you believe in God or not, uh, we are all created in the image of God. Theologians call it the Imago Dei. And God has that ability to speak to every one of us through conscience and lead us into what's right and keep us away from what's wrong. And I think we're all born with a really strong conscience, an all strong sense of right and wrong. And I think we lose it as time goes on. And we lose it by ignoring it. Because God God's a gentleman. God is not going to pound the door open and force himself into a life that doesn't want him. And so if we hear something in our conscience and we go, ah, eh, I'm not going to bother with that, we ignore it, and then the conscience gets quieter and quieter the more we disobey it or ignore it till the Bible talks about a place that we can come where our conscience gets seared over. It, it develops this crust over it that's so hard that nothing can penetrate it, and you can't even hear the voice of conscience, can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit anymore. But God does give us a conscience, both, both as a pre preventative measure to help keep us from sin and help us know what's right and wrong before making a decision, but also as a restorative measure to give us that thing that we call a guilty conscience. Now, guilt gets a bad rap sometimes, I think. Um, because, and that's because we confuse guilt with shame. Guilt and shame aren't the same thing. Um, shame makes you, shame attacks your identity. Shame makes you feel unworthy. You do something wrong and you think, I am a horrible, lousy person. Who would ever love me? I'm going to just crawl under the covers and stay there forever. And you just feel so ashamed, you don't, can't even face the world. That's shame. Guilt starts in the same place. Guilt is like, yeah, I've done something wrong. I feel lousy about it. But it's something I did. It's not something that's not kind of who I am. So I, I'm going to go to whoever I wronged and ask their forgiveness. I'm going to go to God and ask his forgiveness and then move on, move on with my life. Guilt, shame is from the enemy. Shame is from the devil trying to put us down. Guilt is a gift from God so that we don't stay in that position of sin and feel comfortable there. It makes us uncomfortable so that we have to deal with it and come closer to God and come to God and ask for forgiveness. Guilt is like pain, I think. You know, God has given us pain for a reason. You take your hand, you stick it on the top of, well, I want to, you wouldn't put it on the front right burner of my stove because it doesn't work. You put it on the front left burner of the stove and you just you know, and you turn it on, and after a while, you kind of, you move your hand because of the pain, right? You don't want any, you don't want to burn your hand. But, like we talked about our conscience being seared over, so you don't feel it anymore. But what if we didn't have pain? You just stick your hand on that thing, on the burner, and it would stay, and it would stay, and it would stay, and you would end up having damage beyond repair. God's giving us guilt, guilty conscience is a gift so that we don't stay in a place where we get damaged beyond repair, but that we can come to God. 
Okay, so we've we recognized we're a sinner. We, we feel guilty. Now what? What do we do? Well, the one thing we don't do is try to earn God's favor. Try to do good things to outweigh the bad. There are people who think that life is a scale. And God has this big scale in heaven. And it's like, you know, if I put a, take all the bad things I do on one side, and I, if I do all the good things on the other side, and if the good outweighs the bad, then I'm good to go. And if the bad outweighs the good, well, then I better work a little harder to, to do good. It's not the way it works. Romans 3.20 is, again said, no one will be declared righteous by the works of the law. You cannot be declared righteous by the things you do. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which Gina read for, oh no, which um, Helen read for us, it says, it is, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You can't earn forgiveness from God, you can't earn his love, you can't earn his acceptance by, by good works, by doing a whole bunch of good things. It's only by doing one thing, by doing one thing, and that is by saying four, to, uh, to, to make it as simple as I can, to say four words to God and mean them with all of your heart. And those four words are, I'm sorry, take over. I'm sorry, take over. I'm sorry means we recognize and confess our sin. First John 1 John 1.9, which Gina read for us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We see the wrong things we've done in our life the way God does, as missing his standards for our lives. And so we, we say, I'm sorry, and we confess, and we ask for his forgiveness. And the scripture says that God is loving and just, and he will forgive us our sins. So some people will ask, well, why doesn't a loving God just forgive everybody? I mean, he's supposed to be God of love, right? So why is he, like, turning some people away? Why doesn't he just love everybody? I mean, I mean God should be saying, Adolf? Adolf, I know there was that whole Holocaust thing and that six million dead people, but you know what? I'm a loving God, so Adolf, just come on in. It's okay. Come on into heaven. That's an extreme example. But we've all done things that have broken God's heart, that have gone against God's standard. And God is true to himself in that he is loving. He actually loves Hitler or loved him. But he's also just. He's loving and he's just at the same time. And to be true to himself, he has to be both love and justice. So how does that work? The cross. The cross is where love and justice meet. They intersect at the cross. It's where Jesus, who was 100% God and 100% human, went and took the penalty for our sin. Because he was 100% God, he was pure and sinless, and he could be the sacrifice for our sins. And because he was 100% human, he could represent us and be the sacrifice for our sins as our representative. And our sins, the wrong things that we've done, can be laid on his shoulders, can be put on him, and we can be forgiven because of the cross where love and justice meet. God, in his love, provided someone to meet the demands of his justice. God, in his love, provided Jesus to meet the demands of his justice. I, analogies aren't perfect, but I, I like the analogy of the judge who is presiding over a court case and his son is the guilty person, is the accused, and his son is standing in the prisoner's box and, and he's guilty, he's guilty of sin. Like everybody, the evidence is against him. It's, it's clear, he's confessed. All that's left is the sentencing. And so the judge, the father of the, of the young man, has to be, a as his role as a judge, he says, I, 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 I declare that you are guilty and you must spend the next 25 years in prison with no chance of parole for your crime. And he bangs the gavel down to proclaim that this is so. And then as everybody starts milling about, he gets up and he takes off his robe and he walks down from the judge's bench down to where the prisoner is standing and he opens that little gate and he says to his son, you can go free. And then he walks up into the prisoner's box and he stands there and goes, I will pay the penalty. I will spend the 25 years in prison. Justice has been done. Someone will pay the penalty for what has been done. But love has also happened where someone else has taken the place of the guilty party. And that's what God has provided for us 
through Jesus. We're guilty. We're guilty of sin. And yet he's provided someone else to take, to take our place and to be our Savior. So the four words were, I'm sorry, and the next two were, take over. And that is basically saying, God, I really, I'm honest here, I haven't done that great a job of running my life. Things are kind of a mess right now. Things are falling apart at the seams. And I know that you created me. I know that you're more powerful than me. I would like you to take over my life. I would like you to run my life. I will try my best with your help to do life the way that you want me to. Takeover is really important because it's so easy to abuse I'm sorry. When I was a kid, I figured saying I'm sorry was the right thing to do. So I said it to my parents often, ad nauseum. (laughs) Until the point my mom said, you know what? Your I'm sorry's don't mean much anymore because you keep going back and doing the same thing after you said I'm sorry. It's, it, you've, you've, it's it lost its meaning. It's easy to abuse I'm sorry. There's two parts in scripture where Paul is dealing with churches who have come to him and said, well, Paul, you're saying that if that God's grace is so amazing and is poured out on us, his mercy and his forgiveness, if we sin, he, he pours out his grace on us and his mercy. So, we want more of God's grace and mercy, so, so why don't we just sin more? If we sin a whole bunch, then God's forgiveness and grace and mercy will come to us. And Paul's like, you're such idiots. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not the way it works. It doesn't work that way. In 1 John 2, 1, which is a couple of verses after that verse we talked about, if we confess our sins, John says, I write this to you so that you will not sin. His purpose in saying you know, God will forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness is not so that you can abuse it. It's so that in thankfulness for what God has done in your life, you'll move forward into a life that doesn't sin and that you will exhibit repentance. Repentance is an important piece of the puzzle. Repentance means doing a 180. You're heading in this direction. You're heading towards what you want to do. You're heading towards sin. You're heading towards your own, you know, you're in charge of your own life. And then God kind of breaks in, and you realize, I got to do a 180. And I turn around, and I start moving. I'm sorry, I'm a puppeteer. So you start moving in the other direction, away from sin and towards God. You stop doing life the way you do it, want to do it, and you move into a different direction. Because sin is a direction. We sometimes think of sin as a line, right? You got this line in the sand, and it's like you draw this line. If I'm over here, then it's good. I'm doing good. And if if I cross that line, then I've done wrong. And that's true. But when we think of it as a line, what we often tend to do as humans is we try to get as close to the line as possible and just without crossing over and so, ah, you know, I could just play a little bit here with this area of my life and and it won't be all that bad. But oftentimes we end up kind of, you know, falling over to the other side. But sin's not just a line, it's a direction. It's a direction where we're heading in our lives. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, am I heading in a line towards wrong or heading in a line towards what I want to do in my life or am I heading in a direction towards God, towards his standards for my life, towards his plan for my life, towards what he wants to do for my life, in my life. When I think of all this, this whole topic, I, again, analogies aren't perfect, but I like the analogy of a wedding and marriage and really relationships. So a guy and a girl meet each other and they, they start to be interested in each other and they, they date, or maybe if you're a little more fas- old fashioned, you court and then you get engaged and you, you begin to explore and discover more about each other and, and to the point where you fall in love and you decide you wanna spend the rest of your life with that person. And then you get married and you say, I do, and you have that commitment in front of everybody and then you move on and it doesn't just end there. You grow to get to know each other more as the years pass and your life becomes more intertwined with each other and you become one. It doesn't just stop. It's not like you you have a wedding and you say, I do, and then you live separate lives. There was a girl at the university. She came to me and she she wanted me to marry her and her boyfriend. How long have you been going out? A couple weeks. But we've known each other for a long time. And they were international students. And so it was like, she, her plan was that she would stay, they get married, but then they'd go off and he'd go back to the Netherlands and she'd stay in Canada and they would kind of do their own thing in life, though married. And I was like, 
that's not how marriage works. You, you don't do, I mean, you still kind of live your own lives, but you live it together. You don't, you're not separated. Um, I think it's the movie Fiddler on the Roof where um, a, the wife says to the husband, you never say you love me anymore. You never say you love me. And the husband turns to her and says, well, 25 years ago at our wedding, I told you I loved you. If anything changes, I'll let you know. Doesn't work that way either. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, we, just, we don't just point back to one point in time in our life and say that that's good forever. We grow and grow and grow and get to know each other. So we have the, but between those two points of growing in dating and in marriage, there's this I do moment in the middle where you, you come and, and publicly commit to each other in front of a bunch of people and you say, I do for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. You make this commitment. You, you leave the single life behind, and you make this commitment to do life together moving forward. And I believe we all have to have an I do moment with God, where we, some of us might be in a, a situation like we're dating, in the sense that we're getting to know God and understand him. We're asking questions. We're wondering if this is a relationship worth pursuing. Um, some of us might be in a situation where we, we said I do to God and we're, we're growing more and more like him and becoming, getting to know him more and more. But somewhere in that, in that continuum, there's this I do moment with God where we kind of leave our old life behind and we move forward with him. And weddings happen at an altar. An altar is talked about a lot in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, an altar is where God is worshipped. God is the center of what happens at an altar. An altar is where sacrifices are made. In the Old Testament, animals were taken and killed on the altar as a sacrifice of worship to God to foreshadow that Jesus would be killed. That's why we were singing, worthy is the lamb before. We weren't praising farm animals. It was Jesus is the lamb of God. He, the animals that were killed on an altar, the lambs, foreshadowed what was going to happen with Jesus. And on the altar is where things go to die. The altar is where our old life goes to die. And an altar is where the people would walk away new with a new and restored relationship with God. And it's the same with us, where we, we're called to come to an altar and have an I do moment with God, where God's at the center, where, where we give up our old way of life, our old way of life goes to die, and God gives us a new and restored relationship to move forward. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And what happens when we have that I do moment with God is that we have the forgiveness of sins that we've been talking about. And the scripture says that he takes our sins and removes them from us as far as the east is from the west. It's not something where if you get into an argument with someone and they bring up something you did five years ago, you're always doing this. Five years ago, I remember when you did this. God's not like that. He's not going to bring it up again. He'll, if we have that I do moment with God and, and say I'm sorry, take over and ask for your forgiveness, he will remove it as far as the east is from the west. Drop it into the sea of his forgetfulness. The front of a church is often called the altar. And you could have an I do moment with God right where you're sitting. And God can speak to you right where you are. But sometimes the physical body needs to do something to reflect what's going on in the spiritual body. We're sad and physical tears come to our face. We're happy and a physical smile comes to our face. And sometimes we're called to do something physical to match what's going on on the inside. And throughout history of the church, people have been given the opportunity to come to an altar physically, and to have an I do moment with God. And that's what I want to do for you this morning. I want to give you the opportunity, if you've never done that before, to have an I do moment with God, to have a time where you could say, I'm sorry, God, take over, to, to admit sin, to confess it, to ask for forgiveness, to receive forgiveness, and then to commit to do that 180, to commit to say, okay, my life was going in this direction, but God, because of what you're doing in my life, because I want to follow you, I'm going to do a 180 and go in a different direction. 
it takes a lot of courage to, to kind of leave where you are and to come and stand in the front of a church and, and do an I do moment. <laughs> like, it takes a lot of courage, I think, for a husband and wife to do that at a wedding. I remember a couple of wedding, one wedding I did where it was just, I think I had to help hold the groom up because <laughs> he was just so nervous and scared. It takes a lot of courage to do that. But I can tell you, um, if God is moving you to do something like that, you will not ever, ever forget it. And so in a couple minutes, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never had that I do commitment moment with God, you've never said to him, I'm sorry, take over, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do something very courageous and step out of your seat and come to an altar and have that I do moment with God. And you know, there is such a thing as renewing your vows. Anybody ever know anybody who's ever done that? Like maybe a 25th or 50th wedding anniversary renewed their vows. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, well, I've had maybe you're like the fiddler on the roof guy. <laughs> I had that moment 25 years ago and God, if anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> you know, maybe you've had that I do moment with God, but you've been living separate lives like my university friend. Maybe you're even heading for divorce. And maybe you might need to step out of where you are and come to an altar and have a new I do moment with God and renew your vows and confess sin and begin a new relationship with him all over again and do that 180. Come to the altar where the old life of self dies and a new life with Christ begins. Lord, I thank you for, for your word. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you, Lord, for your objective moral law, which tells us right from wrong. And I thank you, Lord, that you have made a way through Christ. You have made, a, through your love, you've made a way for justice to be done. And yet that justice was done without harming us, without destroying us. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our penalty of sin on the cross. And Lord, we want to say, I'm sorry. We want to say, take over. And we want to say, Lord, I do. I commit to you. I want to do life together with you. I'm tired of doing life alone. I want to do life with you. Lord, I pray that you would just move on our hearts in these next few moments, and that something would be done in our hearts and lives that would last for eternity. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.